Well, good morning, Meadowbrook Church. How are we doing this morning? It's good to see you. It's good to be with you. Special welcome to those of you who are joining us online. We are so glad that you are with us this morning. So it was the spring of 2020, and everyone was in full-on lockdown mode. And our family was about a month into what we called crisis schooling our kids. And on this given day, we had finished all of the schoolwork. Um, It was about noon, and everything was done, so it was like, what are we going to do for the rest of the day? Um, And we decided to play some games. So I'm playing Connect Four with our youngest daughter, Lucy, and she was five at the time. And I'm sitting there playing this game with her, and I see that I have got a three-diagonal row going of black tokens, and that I'm holding this black token, and I've got one more move, and I win the game. Now, we have played about four or five games at this point, and Lucy, at five years old, did not like to lose. And and it wasn't just like, oh, I lost. It was like full-on meltdown mode every time she would lose a game. Big tears, big emotions, lots of like, oh, drama around it. So naturally, as a dad, When I play games with her, to avoid that, I always just let her win. It's a little different now, but back then, always let her win. And so I'm sitting there with this token in hand, thinking to myself, what do I do? I I have a decision to make. One more move, and I win the game, but if I do, we could have a big, huge meltdown. So in that moment, I make a decision to throw caution to the wind, and I place the token on the top of the diagonal, and I win, and it takes her a minute to like recognize that. She's about to take another move and keep the game going, and I'm like, no, 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 Lucy, look. One, two, three, four in a row. What does that mean? And she's like, you win. And I was like, "Uh uh-huh, and I'm just bracing myself for it, right? But instead, she like throws her head back She laughs uncontrollably, and she's like, whoa, how about that? And I was like, oh my gosh, like what's going on? So we play another game, and I'm like, all right, I'm going to do it again, all right? So, So we play again, and I win again, and she laughs again, and then I'm like, I'm going to see now how quickly I can beat her at Connect Four. Six moves, five moves, one game four moves, and I just completely demolish her. I'm like inside just like, connect four champion. (laughs) And each time she loses, she laughs. And somewhere along the way in the middle of that winning, I realized, oh, maybe I'm the one who's actually losing. Because what I'm losing is her. Like she's growing up, she's getting older, she's changing. And so naturally in that moment, I think to myself, you know, just like I was before, I'm going to limit myself and I'm going to let her win to regain some of that little girl that's still left in her. And limiting yourself with your own kids is a natural thing to do. Anybody who's raised kids, anybody who's hung out with kids, you know that sometimes in order to really connect well with little ones, the best thing you can do is limit yourself, right? If you're wrestling with your kids, you're obviously withholding some of your strength because you could snap them in half if you, you know, exerted all of your power. Sometimes in conversations with kids, we limit our intellect just to engage with them on their level. Hanging out with little ones and limiting yourself, whether it's your kids or somebody else's kids, is a natural thing to do. But what about limiting yourself with somebody else who's an equal to you, same age as you, who's a peer of yours? Like, that may not be as natural or intuitive to us. Because we live in a culture that continually sows the seed of the message to live without limits, to live limitless. Like, you you see it in different places in our culture. Like, there's this ad for Beats headphones, right? I think this is Serena Williams. It might be kind of hard to see, but in the full body shot, there's a, a, a line of text that goes right in front of her that says, unlimit yourself. Now, at first glance, you're like, well, 
what are we selling here? Are we selling tennis? Are we selling tennis gear? We're actually selling headphones here, athletic headphones, which is interesting because it's not quick and intuitive when you look at that image, and that's because advertising doesn't often sell products. What they sell is a worldview. They sell, they sell a way to view the world that would connect with people, and then they have them hooked in to buy their product. And so they're selling a worldview of, of unlimit yourself. Don't, don't limit yourself. Don't box yourself in. Just let it all out. Or you could go to City Field where the Mets play, and you could find yourself sitting in an endless eat seat, right? You buy a ticket, and you have all you can eat at concessions, right? But we live in a world that continually gives this message of don't put any constraints on yourself. Don't put any limits on yourself. Live unrestricted and just go do whatever you want. The priority of our culture is the self living how you want. But when it comes to the kingdom, when it comes to the way of Jesus, it could be said that maybe you actually win when you lose. Maybe you actually gain something when you limit yourself, you restrict yourself for the sake of others. And as we cross into chapter 15, now we're about a chapter and a half into Paul talking about what he calls disputable matters. He finishes this section on disputable matters, encouraging and challenging the church in Rome to consider limiting themselves for the sake of other people. This is how chapter 15 begins. Paul says this in verse 1. We who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak. Now, we're in this section of Romans where the situation for why Paul is writing Romans really begins to emerge, right? It's easy to forget that, that Paul isn't writing Romans because he's writing a theological thesis, right? He, you see all of the dense theology that he puts out all through the beginning part of the book, and you think, oh, the, the reason Paul wrote Romans was to really lay out his theology. That, that's actually not the case. The reason Paul writes Romans <clears throat> is because there's a situation in the Roman church that is causing conflict, and he's writing to address it. And as you enter into chapter 14 and 15, that situation emerges, and the challenge that this church is facing is that they're divided. Their unity is compromised. Now, Paul never uses the word unity throughout the book of Romans, but when you get to this section, <clears throat> it is the thing to which he's challenging this church to do. And the division, right, if they're not united, they're divided, and the division that lies in the church lies along the lines of two groups of people, those he calls the weak and those he calls the strong. Now, these might be weird terms for us, right, to think of calling some weak and some strong, because that implies the way we hear it, that one group is better than the other, right? It's better to be strong than to be weak, so therefore the strong group must be better than the weak group. And you see it in verse 1. He says, we who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak. But, but these two terms, weak and strong, are actually terms that other writers would use in Paul's day when talking about similar issues. They would use these two terms in similar ways as Paul would. And basically, these two terms, the categories of weak and strong, are used to describe a debate on social and cultural freedoms that one does or doesn't have with regard to their religious beliefs. And so for Paul in chapters 14 and 15, he's talking about food, what food they can and cannot eat, should and shouldn't eat, drink that they should or shouldn't consume in days that they consider either holy or common. And the basic debate going on in the church is that the strong feel like they have this freedom to eat what they want, drink what they want, and do what they want on any given day of the week. And the weak are saying, no, 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 we, we should abstain from certain foods, we should abstain from certain drinks, 
And we should consider these specific days as holy or sacred. And so the difference that these two groups have is causing division. And it's causing them to judge, despise, and condemn each other. And so what Paul is doing here is he's specifically talking to the strong. Earlier in chapter 14, he specifically talks to the weak. Here he's specifically talking to the strong. And you've got to imagine the church in Rome is hearing this letter read, sitting in a group like this. And it could be that there is an actual divide in the room. The weak are sitting on this side. The strong are sitting on this side. They're actually divided. And so the person who would have been reading this letter and teaching this letter could have been actually looking at those who kind of sat on the weak side of the room and then looking at those who sit on the strong side of the room. And he says here to the strong, we who are strong. Sorry, I labeled you guys weak in the way that I just did that. We who are strong, right, ought to bear with the failings of the weak. Now, that might sound demeaning. It, it might sound as though those who are strong are thinking to themselves, like, you know, stinking weak people, right? They've got their religious, ridiculous, religious restrictions. And Paul says we just have to put up with them. Ugh, like, what a drag, right? Like, you might think that's what Paul is saying when he says, we who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak. And, and that word failing is really strong in Greek. It actually just means weakness. You need to bear with the weakness of the weak. But what Paul is really saying here isn't so much that you have to put up with those who are weak or those who think differently than you. What he's really trying to say here is what he says next. He says, we who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not please ourselves. That's the emphasis of what Paul is trying to say. Not please ourselves. Each of us should please our neighbors for their good to build them up. Now again, Paul never uses the word unity, but what he lays out in this section of chapter 15 is three things, or three things that we can do to nurture unity in a family of faith. And the first thing he's calling us to do is to put others first. He's saying, don't live in such a way to please yourself, but please other people for the sake of of building them up. So Paul here is calling those who feel as though they have greater cultural and social freedom to essentially limit their freedom. To limit their freedom for the sake of other people. Not always and forever. Not in any and every situation. But in certain situations where limiting their cultural and social freedom could help encourage and build someone else up. You limit yourself for the sake of building up somebody else. So when I first started in ministry, I was a youth pastor. In the first church that I served in the winter, we would take our kids on a skiing and snowboarding trip for the weekend. And uh, the first time we did this, I said, hey, Becky, do you, do you want to come with us on this trip? Now, I grew up snowboarding. We lived in New Hampshire. We used to go to Vermont all the time and snowboard. Uh, Becky, growing up in La Crosse, didn't grow up skiing or snowboarding. So I was like, hey, this could be really fun. Uh, we could go together, and I will teach you how to snowboard. Uh, we have since learned through many trial and error in our marriage that Brian teaching Becky anything is not a good idea. It's better to pay for an instructor to do it than try and save the money and have me do it. I'm like, this will be great. This will be fun. And so when you snowboard, obviously you stand going downhill, one foot in front of the other. And if you just do that and you just go for it going downhill, you fly. I mean, if you don't know how to stop, if you don't know how to control yourself, you just go. And, and I was pretty good right? What you have to do when you snowboard, you have to learn how to use your edges because it's your edges that help you control your speed. And so when a person is first learning how to snowboard, you do what's called toe sliding and heel sliding. So instead of going downhill like this, 
you go downhill like this, sitting on your back edge, learning how to move one way, move another way, and use your edge. And then you do it facing uphill, going the other way with your toe edge, you, you toe slide and you heel slide in order to learn how to use your edge. So that meant on this day, that's all I was teaching her. I was teaching her how to use her toe. So she would face down the mountain, I would face up the mountain, and I would hold her hands and I would say, okay, go this way on your edge, go that way on your edge. And we did it for about 10 minutes. And I was like, she's got this down, right? And so I'm like, all right, you ready to put it all together? And that did not go well either. Because she's like, no, I'm not ready. And I was like, you can do it. And we went back and forth. And she was like, I'm done. This is a bad idea, right? Because what I was doing in that moment is I was teaching her, not for the sake of building her up, but I was teaching her so that I could just go snowboard and hopefully she could keep up with me after 10 minutes of practice, right? See, the, the goal is to limit yourself for the sake of others. What, what should have been my posture that day is I'm going to spend the whole day and if I never really get to just fly down the mountain, I should be okay with that because what I'm doing here is I'm working to build her up. I should restrict myself even for a whole day if I need to in order to build her up. Paul is saying for those who feel like they have greater social and cultural freedom, there are times when you should restrict your freedom for the sake of building up other people. Basically, it's the practice of putting someone else first, is what he's saying. Put others first. Paul will say in Philippians 2, look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. And again, because the way our, cultural sh our culture shapes a priority of self into us, this can be counterintuitive. It can be counterintuitive because we're told all the time in our culture, put yourself first, do what you want, and then consider everybody else second, or maybe even third. And Paul's saying, no, 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 no. Consider them first and live in a way to please them, even if it means restricting your freedom. And the reason we do this, he says, is because as Jesus followers, this is how Jesus lived. This is what he says in verse 3. For even Christ did not please himself. Jesus did not put himself first, but he lowered himself. The, the biblical idea here is that those who have advantage, individuals who have power, individuals who have advantage in life, should be quick to lessen their power and disadvantage themselves for the sake of other people. We count, call this downward mobility. Living in a society that's like infatuated with upward mobility, Jesus teaches us the opposite. We are called to deny ourselves. And then Paul goes on to quote Psalm 69. He says, but as it is written, introducing the quote, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. Now, it's thought that Psalm 69 is what we call a messianic psalm. It's a psalm that kind of foreshadows the Messiah and how the Messiah who's Jesus, will live in a way to bring redemption to the world. And Psalm 69 is thought to be a foreshadow of the insults that Jesus would receive as he made his way to the cross. In the whole scenario of Jesus heading to the cross, being arrested, hanging on the cross, Jesus had power in that place, in that moment, to defeat those who were crucifying him to defeat those who were throwing insults at him. You read in Matthew 26, this is after his arrest, he's on trial, and he says in verse 53, I could call down 12 legions of angels. A legion is thought to be in military terms somewhere between 3,000 and 5,000 soldiers. So 12 legions of angels would be thousands upon thousands, 50, 60, 70,000 angels. He's like, I have that many angels at my disposal. Don't you think that if I wanted to get out of this arrest and crucifixion, I could? But he says that to say, but I'm intentionally limiting myself for the sake of bringing redemption to the world. Instead of defeating the powers that be, he limits his, himself and allows himself to be defeated by them. In doing so, he disadvantages himself 
for the sake of the disadvantage, namely us. People whose lives are riddled with sin and brokenness and dysfunction. He comes to us lowering himself in order to meet us so that, right where we are, so that he can bring us to a new place. So one way that we nurture unity in the body is through putting others first. The other way we do it is we allow the scriptures to shape us. Now, what's interesting about verse 4 is that verse 4 seems to break the flow of what Paul is saying. Because in verse 2 and 3, Paul is talking about putting others first, please other people, not yourself, just as Jesus did. And then you'll find in verse 5, Paul will name putting putting others first comes from a certain mindset. It's the mindset that Jesus had, right? He says this in verse 5. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Jesus had. Essentially, he's saying have the same mindset as Jesus, which is all about putting others first, pleasing others, not yourself. Now, in between these verses comes verse 4, which says, For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through endurance, the endurance taught in the Scriptures, and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. So, in between those verses, in verse 4, he's talking about the purpose of the Scriptures. The purpose of the Scriptures being to teach us, to give us encouragement, to give us endurance, ultimately, so that we have hope. Essentially, he's saying the Scriptures have the ability to shape something in you, encouragement, endurance, hope. If you put yourself before the Scriptures repeatedly and regularly, you should find endurance, encouragement, and hope being shaped in your heart. It's almost as though what he's doing here is showing that as you do that, as you allow the Scriptures to shape encouragement, endurance, and hope in you, the other thing that happens is that same mindset that Jesus had of putting others first will also be shaped in you as well. So I received a call to the ministry when I was in college. My sophomore-ish year in college, it felt clear to me that God was calling me to be a pastor. One of the things I quickly learned when I was a sophomore in college was I knew nothing of the Scriptures. Like I had grown up my whole life in the church, barely cracked a Bible, just went to church, did the activities, but never really studied the Word. And the way that I learned this was after I received this call to ministry, I started being discipled by the associate pastor of our church. And one day in a conversation, his name was Tom, Pastor Tom. He said, hey, Brian, let's talk through the storyline of the scriptures. I was like, oh, that'd be great. Let's do it. So he's like, what happens first in the Bible? I'm like, God creates everything. Seven days, he creates everything. He creates Adam and Eve. He puts them in this good world, in this garden. They're called to work the garden with him. He's like, great. What happens next? I was like, oh, they mess up big time. They sin, they eat from the tree they're not supposed to eat from. Death, destruction, and sin enters our world, and everything goes bad. It's like, then what happens? I was like, your guess is as good as mine, Tom. I mean, I had no idea. And he tries to lead me in this moment. He's like, you know, there was no. He's like, no. He's like, no. I'm like, no, 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 no. I have no idea. He's like, there's Noah. I'm like, ah, yeah, Noah and the big flood. He's like, then what happens after Noah? I'm like, this is going to be a long session, Tom. I have no idea. (laughs) But in that conversation, I realized I just, I don't know the Bible. So it was a natural connection to say, okay, I have to go to seminary to learn the scriptures. So I went into seminary with the mindset of I'm going to master the scriptures. I'm going to know everything there is to know about the Bible by the time I leave. So my mindset was to learn and to study and master the scriptures. And what I got from that was a whole bunch of anger in my heart. Because what happened was, there was a day, I was working on a a sermon outline for a preaching class. It wasn't even writing a sermon, just an outline, outlining a passage in the book of Mark. And it was like a Thursday night in my dorm room working on this, and it was so ridiculously hard. Like, 
I had maybe preached one or two sermons at that point in my life, and I was like, putting a sermon outline together is really tricky, especially when it's a story, and there's all this dialogue, and there's all these different characters. I have no idea. And about an hour after working on it, I was just so filled with anger because I couldn't do it because it was hard. I pushed back from my desk, and I took like a 30-minute walk around campus, just like, I, this is hard. I have no idea what I'm doing. And I'm supposed to teach people the Bible? I can't even write a sermon outline, let alone teach people anything. And then about two weeks after that, I was in a conversation with my friend Matt. And we were just talking about the things we were learning at seminary. We were about, I don't know, a half a year into our program at this point. And my friend Matt in this conversation says, you know, the thing that I'm learning is that I have this propensity to want to master the Scriptures. But what I really need is for the Scriptures to master me. I remember being in that conversation thinking, what did you just say? Like, what, t tell me more about that. It struck a chord with me because I was trying really hard to master the Scriptures, and it was really tricky and really difficult because they're complex. It's a big book with lots of pages and lots of words. Lots of words that I didn't understand, places I didn't know, names I couldn't pronounce, really hard. He's like, yeah, God is teaching me that my call isn't to master the Scriptures, but is to be mastered by them. I was like, ah, yeah. If we let the Scriptures master us and shape us, what happens is that the character of Christ is then shaped in us. And then we have the ability to have the mindset of Jesus. Because without that, it's easy to use the Scriptures to prove my rightness, to try and impress other people, to try and win arguments and prove that I'm right and they're wrong. And Paul says this, addresses this in 1 Corinthians 8. He says, knowledge puffs up, but love, and an act of love would be limiting yourself for the sake of others, love builds up. You have the option when it comes to the Scriptures to either master the Scriptures and puff your life up or be mastered by them so that you can build other people up. And when we do that, when we allow the Scriptures to shape us so that the mindset of Jesus is shaped in us, unity results. This is what he says in verse 6. So that with how many minds? One mind. And how many voices? One voice. With one mind and one voice, you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. See, by putting others first, by allowing the Scriptures to shape you so that the character and mindset and heart of Jesus is shaped in you, you then have the potential to nurture unity in a family of faith. And then the last thing that he encourages us here is to accept one another. Verse 7, accept one another then. Now, it's interesting when you, again, read through 14 and 15, chapters 14 and 15, because there are times when Paul is specifically talking to the weak. Sorry, again, you guys are labeled the weak. There's other times he's talking to the strong, right? But here it seems as though he's talking to both groups. Accept who? One another. Both groups. You're called to accept one another. So, so weak, stop judging each other and condemning those who are strong for the way that they are using their cultural freedom. And those of you who are strong, stop despising those who are weak, who feel as though they need to restrict themselves from certain freedoms. Accept one another right where you are. Why? Because again, this is what Jesus did. Accept one another then just as Christ accepted you. Jesus accepted you right where you were, for the sake of bringing you to the place where He longs you to be. See, what's so beautiful about the gospel is that Jesus accepts us right where we are, not for the sake of leaving us there, not because He's okay with the sin and the brokenness in our world, but He does so to meet us in our sin and our brokenness so that He can bring us to the place where He wants us to be, so that we can be transformed, he says. If we rewind back to chapter 12, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It's all about transformation. It's all about becoming the person that God desired you and designed you to be, which is the spitting image of Jesus in this world. 
And the message of the gospel is that Jesus limits himself. He lowers himself. He disadvantages himself for the sake of the disadvantaged, namely us. That's what he says in verse 8. For I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the Jews. Notice that. The servant of the Jews. Notice that word. He's become a servant of the Jews on behalf of God's truth. Jesus lowered himself to be a servant of the Jews, ultimately so that through the Jewish people, they would be a light of revelation to the Gentiles. Because he goes on to say, so that the promises made to the patriarchs, the forefathers of our faith, might be confirmed, and moreover that, the Gentiles, right? Notice that. Jews and Gentiles might glorify God in his mercy. See, not only is the dividing line in the church in Rome probably weak and strong, it's also Jew-Gentile. It's thought that the weak are probably those who grew up with the Torah, the Jewish law, and they're trying to impose that on the strong, who would be the Gentiles. There's this ethnic split in the church, and he's saying, accept one another. The whole vision for the family of God the whole time was that it would be a diverse family of Jew and Gentile, people from all over the world, every tribe, nation, and tongue coming together under the banner of Jesus. And he says, when you put others first, when you allow the scriptures to shape you, when you accept one another, then and only then do you have the chance for unity to be nurtured in the church. And what Paul is trying to say here is that you never lose when you limit yourself for the sake of the gospel. When you limit yourself for the sake of the gospel, even though it might feel like you're losing because you're limiting yourself, you never lose because Jesus always wins. And when we limit ourselves and we accept others and we nurture unity, the two things that we gain are one, we create context for more people to come to faith. Because it's less about rules and regulations and restrictions, and it's like, come explore Jesus. Come explore this relationship with me that has changed my life. Come into that. And in the process, we glorify God. We gain the glory of God. And that's how Paul finishes this passage. He starts to quote all of these Old Testament verses, and in every quotation, there's a call for Gentiles to come into the family of God, and there's a praise reference to God. As it is written, this is verse 9, Therefore, I will praise you among the Gentiles. I will sing the praises of your name. Verse 10, again, it says, quoting the Old Testament, Rejoice, you Gentiles, with his people. Verse 11, and again, praise the Lord, you, all you Gentiles. Let the peoples extol him. Verse 12, and again, Isaiah says, The root of Jesse, which is a reference to Jesus, will spring up, one who will arise to rule over the nations. In him the Gentiles will have hope. The plan for God's people all along has to br- is to bring in those who are far from God so that they can know him and receive his glory. Because when you hear this idea of like, oh, God wants us to glorify him, often it sounds like that's something we do apart from God. We give him glory and we have none. But as you back up to Romans 8, Paul says this. He says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. God is trying to pull us into his glory. He's trying to have his glory cover the earth as the waters cover the seas. And we are caught up and swept up in that. Everybody is looking for glory, and oftentimes we find or we think that getting glory is through winning and not limiting ourselves. It's through doing what I want, going where I want, living how I want, so that I can win at life and get the glory. And Paul's saying, no, no, no. Like, God gives it to you. All you have to do is accept it. And you might actually find that you get it through limiting yourself. Because with the gospel, you never lose when you limit yourself. Uh, For those of you who are NBA fans in the 90s, uh, you may remember the 1994 playoffs. Um, This was the year after Michael Jordan retired for the first time. And the Bulls had just won three consecutive championships. They're in the playoffs playing the Knicks. Scottie Pippen is now the star player on the Bulls. He sat behind Jordan 
was the number two guy for all those years Jordan played. Jordan now retires. Scottie Pippen's the number one guy. They're playing in the playoffs. I think it's game three against the Knicks. The game is tied, and there's 1.8 seconds left on the clock. The Bulls call a timeout. They pull everybody to the sidelines. Phil Jackson draws up a play, and everybody's thinking, hey, Scottie Pippen's probably going to get the ball. He's the star player. And so he draws up a play where Scottie Pippen doesn't get the ball. Tony Kukoc is going to get the ball. And so they break the huddle. Everybody's going back onto the floor. Scottie Pippen doesn't go onto the floor. He goes to the end of the bench and sits down, throws himself a little pity party which there's confusion on the Bulls' sideline, and they're like, hey, hey, what's, what's going on here? Causing them to call another timeout, regroup again, and Phil Jackson and Scottie Pippen exchange words. And he's like, you got to go on the, pl- go on the floor. He's like, I'm not going on the floor. I- I'm the best player. I should get the ball. Why is Tony Kukoc getting the ball? He wasn't willing to limit himself. He was longing for glory, thinking if I make the shot, I get the glory. He refuses to go back in. He sits on the bench. The game goes on. They throw the ball to Tony Kukoc. He turns, make the, makes the shot. The Bulls win the game. And in that moment, who looks like a fool? Scottie Pippen, right? He, he prioritized himself over the team. The team ultimately got the glory. But for Scottie Pippen in that moment, self-glory was more important. What Paul is trying to communicate here is that you never lose when you limit yourself for the sake of the gospel, because it's not about your individual glory. Your individual glory is going to be limited, but God's glory is limitless. And when you step into that with a group of people, it's exponential. And he's calling us into that by lowering ourselves, limiting ourselves, disadvantaging ourselves at times, letting go of certain freedoms we have for the sake of the good of the gospel and God's glory. And so the question for us is where in our lives do we need to lean into that? Where in our lives do we need to let something go for the sake of connecting with others to build them up and to glorify God? So may you see that when you limit yourself for the gospel, you never lose. May you willingly let go at times your freedoms for the sake of the kingdom, and may you find that God's glory fills your life. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for the glory that you have given us through your Son, Jesus Christ. We recognize, Lord, that we often are longing glory that we somehow manufacture on our own. But through your Son, Jesus Christ, Lord, you have freely given it to us. May we receive that, may we step into that, and may we leverage our lives for the sake of loving others. May we be okay with limiting our abilities, our freedoms at times for the sake of serving your people, reaching out to those in need, and building up the kingdom wherever we are. We love you, Lord, and we pray this in your name. Amen.